Brother Center Point online campus. So glad you can join us for Easter Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. So I hope you can join us as we get ready to worship and to lift up his name high in praise. Amen. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind away? It was my turn. Till I met you Here we go Cause I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn yeah. Till I met you
I'm gonna read from scripture now, from Luke chapter 24, starting at verse one. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he had told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The son of man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the stripes of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Amen, church. Let's continue worshiping him.
so much, Lord. We thank you for today, for what today represents. Freedom, Lord. Freedom in you, in your presence, in your name, Father. Thank you that you fulfilled your promise. Lord, we gather here to lift up your name and praise high, singing hallelujah, for you are risen. We thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, open up our hearts, prepare us for your word today. May we receive it to its full. Thank you, Father, in your son's precious name. Amen, amen, church. Hello everyone, welcome to Center Point. Christ is risen. Happy Easter. So glad that you are all here today. My name is Brett. I'm the online campus pastor here. And man, I'm so excited that you uh, decided to make Center Point a part of your Easter. Hey, if you're watching right now, could you give us a, a what's up, a shout out in the chat? We just love to know that you're here. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. And if you're here with us for the first time, uh, do me a huge favor and fill out our digital connect card. That's really the best way for us to know that you are here with us today and also to know where you're at in your journey. Maybe you have some questions about Centerpoint or maybe you have some questions about how to have a relationship with God or you have some prayer, prayer needs in your life today. Um, fill that out and let us know. We'd love to connect with you and see how we can come alongside and, and help um, wherever you're at today. And hey, this has been a uh, historic last couple of weeks here at Center Point. Last week on Palm Sunday, we launched two brand new campuses, two brand new campuses on the same day. Just absolutely amazing. And that's really down to all of the hard work, all of the prayer, all of the giving that we have done together as a church, really just uh, moving forward together um, behind our mission to give every everyone on Long Island multiple opportunities to hear and respond to the gospel. And so I just wanna say thanks to everybody who continues to give here at Center Point so faithfully week after week. You can give at cpchurch.com slash give. Um, but if you are here for the first time today, uh, please feel no obligation uh, to give in any way. Uh, we're just so glad that you are here uh, as a guest today, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the service. And we hope that you'll come back again next week. We're gonna be kicking off a brand new sermon series called Hello, My Name Is, and we have a little promo that we'd like to play uh, for that. But guys, so glad that you're here. Hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Happy Easter. When I was born, my parents named me Katie. I was identified by that name, called by that name. My name and I became synonymous. It was tied to my anxiety, fear, depression, the mistakes of my past, my insecurities. Who I am was being held down, captive. I lived in the shadows of my internal battles, trying to fix my messes, denying the rest. Until one day, I met a man. Someone who not only knew my past, my hurts, my sins, but offered to take it all on, to exchange my sins for his grace, my habits for his ways, my shame for a new name. So allow me to reintroduce myself by my new names. 
My name is accepted, loved, new creation, adopted, redeemed, whole, made new, transformed, because Jesus changes everything. Well, hello, Centerpoint Church. I want to welcome you to our Easter celebration today. I am so glad that you are joining us and that you are watching at home or wherever you might be right now as we celebrate our risen Lord together. And yes, I am in a suit. It is the one Sunday a year that I get dressed up. I swore in a message recently I wasn't going to buy a new suit uh, this year after all of that extra COVID 95 pound weight. But I, I broke down this past week. I got it because I wanted to be comfortable. And here's the thing it, it's very fitting to wear a suit on a special day. That's why I wear them at least. I normally wouldn't wear this to work on a regular day or a regular Sunday. But when I wear a suit, it's normally because of one or two reasons either because I'm doing a funeral or I'm doing a wedding. And when you think about Easter, it's really a representation of the two things. Uh, uh, we're realizing the death of Christ as we celebrate it on Good Friday, but we're also thinking about the wedding. The wedding is the reality since Jesus has risen, he has now taken on a bride, which is his church. And, and so we are celebrating both today. We're celebrating the, the fact that there is a wedding and we're still thinking about the reality of why we're able to have this day, the, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so today I want to talk a little bit this Easter, a different direction than probably anything I've taught on an Easter before. I, I want to talk today about walking with Jesus. You know, one of the great Macmillan pastimes that we have at my house is that we go on family walks. Now, this was a Sarah thing. I'm just going to put it out there. This was not a Brian thing. Like, oh, I want to just spend time with my bride walking. No, I, 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 I wasn't someone who would want to simply walk to connect. That's not me. Uh, I'm the kind of guy, like, if I'm walking, it's because I have to. I'm walking because I, I need to get from point A to B, and my car broke down right? Or, or my bike isn't working, and that's the only reason that I would walk. But for my wife, that's not her. My wife loves the journey. She loves the experience of walking with company, the, the bonding that happens in between. I had a hard time with this when we first got married because my thought was we, we can bond just sitting on the sofa, right? We don't, we don't have to be walking to bond. We lived in East Meadow in this, this little apartment and we would walk around 7th Street in East Meadow. And I'd see the same home and the same dog and the same three neighbors that actually went outside on Long Island with some level of regularity. But the thing is, is she won me over. She, she got me to the point where I enjoyed walking with her. And through our marriage, we now walk as a couple. We walk as a family. And in our walks, we've grown. In our walks, we've had some fights, but we've also made up. Uh, we've shared our day. We've celebrated life's wins. We've cried together in life's losses. We've talked about the mundane to the life-altering details, but so much of that has come out as we're on our walks. Because you see, our walks have built a special relationship between us. It's given us the room where we're putting down our phones and we're connecting with one another. They've given us the space to grow and to connect. I now love our walks because it gives us that moment where we build our relationship. Today, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 24. And I want to read a story that happens right after the resurrection. During worship, we read the passages right before this in the resurrection account in Luke. And I want us to see what it looks like and what we can learn when it comes to walking with Jesus. So here we go. Luke chapter 24, starting at verse 13. It says, Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. 
And, and so real quick, whether Jesus changed his appearance or he just changed the way that they viewed him, we don't know. It doesn't matter. But we see Jesus is walking with them. They have no idea that Jesus is there at this time. It goes on and says, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their face downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? Jesus asked. By the way, I love that Jesus is playing coy right now. I just, right? I just love the way he's in. They, they give him a little sarcasm, and Jesus is like, I don't know. Tell me more. And right here, we get a quick summary of Holy Week. They end up going on. They say about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. It's so interesting because at this point, they're so close, right? They're, they're so close to understanding what has happened, but they're still in disbelief. 25, Jesus then said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have, uh, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now remember, they don't at this point know that it's Jesus. So Jesus goes from, oh, I know nothing, what has happened, to now let me give you a deep theological lesson about everything that is foretold in the Old Testament, the prophecies that were given that the Messiah had to ultimately fulfill. And then lastly, 28 to 31. It says, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Jesus is right there. Can you imagine the conversation that happened after they realized it was Jesus and he vanished? Can you, can you imagine them looking around the room like, did, did, did you know? Did, did you know? I, I guarantee you there was at least one of them like, oh, I, no, I, I knew. You know, like Jesus and I, I was in on it. Like, I of course knew. It, I can't believe you guys didn't know that whole time. Like, I was just playing along. You guys look so foolish. But of course, none of them knew until Jesus revealed himself. And as I said earlier, the thing that I love so much about this story is the seven-mile journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. The seven-mile journey, because as they're on this trek, Jesus shows up. He walks with them. He talks with them. He ultimately ends up also eating with them. And I think there's some really important aspects of faith that we can learn about how to walk with Jesus through this last chapter in Luke. And here's the first thing that I want you to see and think about today. Jesus is right there, and he wants a relationship with you. Jesus is right there, and he wants a relationship with you. You know, everything about Holy Week screams that Jesus wants you to know him and how far he is willing to go to make sure that it happens. Not only does he die on a cross, not only is he resurrected on the third day, but when he appears, he engages now with those that are close to him. We see multiple reports throughout scripture of the people Jesus sees and talks with and even lets touch his hands and his feet to feel the holes from the nails. 
And here, if I was Jesus, after what he just went through, I'd be taking a vacation. I'd be going to Jamaica, right? I'd go to St. Lucia. I I mean, he, he was just resurrected after being tortured on a cross. Like, this is a big deal. Yet what does Jesus do? He goes and he invests in those relationships right away. And all this foreshadows what everyone who puts their faith in Jesus is able to experience. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, you now get to have a relationship with Jesus. You get to know him. You get to walk with him. And it's kind of crazy that Jesus in this moment, as he meets up with them, is simply walking I mean, that's what he's doing, right? He's, he shows up and he's, he, he's walking to Emmaus with them. He's just hanging out with them. The creator of the world is on a casual stroll. And even though they didn't know it yet, they'll eventually know that it was him. And they're going to look back at such fondness at this moment because they had the opportunity to walk with him. Because Jesus chose to do that. It was his desire. It was his preference. It's where he wanted to be. He chose to engage with them. And here's what's incredible about Jesus. Think about this. It it normally costs a lot of money to get time with someone great, doesn't it? Like, like it it normally is going to cost a lot. If you as an average person, just a a regular Joe out there, plain Jane, you want to meet someone famous, it's going to normally cost you quite a bit to get that opportunity, to get that privilege. For example, if you wanted to meet your hero, uh, whether it's because they were music or an athlete or something else, and you wanted to be able to spend some time with them, chances are you're going to have to pay a lot of money at a special event. It's probably going to be a fundraiser where you get to go and shake their hand and get that quick selfie to put on Instagram, but you're going to have to pay for it. And say maybe you're sick and you need to go to the doctor, but you want to go to the best doctor there is. I mean, the specialist of specialists. Well, you know you're going to pay an arm and a leg to make that happen. Or say you get in trouble with the law and you know that this is going to be a tough case. Well, you want to make sure that you're paying the absolutely best lawyer that can get you out. But with any of these people, that you want to see, that you want to be with, they're all going to cost you something great to be able to have the opportunity to get their time. Yet, to get time with Jesus, the Son of God, the most important person that has ever been, you would think that you would have to pay a king's ransom for that opportunity. Yet instead, what does Jesus go and do? He goes and he pays it for you. Not only does he pay it for you on the cross, then he pursues you. The most famous person in all of human history wants to know you. I love in Romans chapter five, verse eight, where Paul writes, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He's saying while you did not deserve it, while you deserve the exact opposite, as a matter of fact, Christ, Jesus, still died for you. This was the ultimate display of love. This is why we celebrate Easter in the way that we do. The reason we celebrate the resurrection of Christ because we see how much he's willing to do, how far he's willing to go to make it so that we can have a relationship with him. You see, we we don't walk with God because we get to, to have him like us more. We don't walk with God because we're, we're hoping if, if we do, then at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, we're going to have this, this uh, moment where he's like, okay, you're walking with me. I'll finally, I'll finally care about you. No, when, when we walk with God, we get to do it. We, we realize like, I, I have the opportunity. I have the privilege. I, I, I get to walk with God. This is incredible. This is the greatest thing that can happen within my life. It is the ultimate honor. 
And you know, I don't have time to unpack all of what that looks like. But a lot of times in the New Testament, based on which translation you're reading, looking at the original Greek, the, Greek, the, the word walk and the word live can mean the same exact thing. Whether you're walking or you're living for God, it's, it's the same concept that we as his people get to be in a constant, regular relationship with him through prayer, through reading of scripture, through worship, knowing that in every moment of our life, Jesus is in fact there once we put our faith in him. Amen? It changes everything. The second thing I want you to see here today is that Jesus is right there. We just have to recognize him. He's right there. We just have to recognize that he is there. Uh, I'm, I am horrible, and I, I've said this many times. I think I say it a lot just to kind of get me off the hook, but I am horrible at recognizing church people outside of church. I, I mean, it has gotten so bad. I, I feel a horrible when it happens. I mean, just, just the other week, uh, last week actually, I was at a restaurant, and someone was walking towards me, and I didn't even think about it for a second until she finally looked at me and goes, Pastor Brian! By the way, that's a great way of letting me know how I know you, right? Just be like, pastor. I'm like, okay, I'll give you a hug. Like, oh, you, right? For all the guys, I'm just like, brother, right? All the women, like, what's up, sister? I, I don't know, all right? I'm sorry. But it's all these moments where it happens. I actually, I'm now that creepy guy. When I'm in the mall, I have to just assume I know everyone because I don't want to offend someone from our church. So when I'm walking in the mall, I'm just open-eyed like this. I'm waving at strangers. You know, if anyone makes any eye contact, I have to assume that they're from the church. So I would rather err being a creepy guy to a stranger than rejecting one of our people from church, right? So I'm like, hi, how you doing? Yes. <laughs> and the thing is, though, is when this happens, I am always so embarrassed when I don't recognize someone. I'm embarrassed. I, to be honest, I, I feel ashamed because I know that I should recognize you. And I can only imagine how the disciples then felt in this moment. Even though Jesus had hid his identity, I'm sure that they were embarrassed. Like, how did we not know? How did we miss it? I, I, I could tell there was something about the way he was talking that, that, that it should have been the, the clue. Like, how did I miss that it was walking with Jesus? Here's the thing, even though they didn't know, he was still there the entire time. It didn't matter that they recognized him or not. He was still present. He was still teaching. He was still building the relationship. He was still on the journey with them. And once they finally did recognize him, everything changed. Once they realized that he was no longer dead, he was no longer in the tomb Nothing was ever going to be the same for these disciples again. He explained everything. He also went as far as even explained why this had to happen. Uh, look a little further there in Luke 24, starting at verse 45. It said, then Jesus opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. And he told them, this is what was written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sin will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And this then is the moment they finally got it. They saw the game plan. They saw the purpose. They started to understand why Jesus had to die why he rose from the third, uh, from the grave on the third day. Like they, they finally understood that this wasn't about an earthly kingdom that Jesus came to erect. Now this, this was something different. This was not about what was happening in the culture. This was what was happening in the heart. This wasn't to overthrow Rome. This was to overthrow sin. This was the moment that they finally understood and now they have a new purpose within this new kingdom that Jesus is establishing to let others know the very same thing about how to overcome the sin of humanity. They got it. <laughs> and they realized in this moment that death didn't defeat Jesus. Jesus defeated death. And because he is alive, that means everything else he ever said was true. Can you imagine how hard those three days were from his death to when they finally realized he was resurrected? Questioning everything. I mean, their own existence. Questioning everything that Jesus had taught them. They thought he was so great, so wonderful, so anointed, so special. And now, then they were doubting, but now they knew. 
Every one of those teachings were true. Everything he said, everything he promised was going to come to pass. Now they had hope, eternal hope, lasting hope. Death is no longer the victor Jesus is. And no matter what happens in this life, they now know that they can have that hope that is eternal. That no matter what happens to their flesh, they know that their soul is secure. They know they have eternity with the Father. This got me thinking of how important it is to recognize hope in all things. Even when you don't feel like Jesus is with you and I go through that, you go through that. If any of us are being honest with ourselves, we have those moments very much like the disciples when Jesus is in the grave where they're like, man, I don't know what's going on right now. But I want to promise you, he is with you. You know, in Hebrews 13, 5, God says, never will I leave you, nor will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. You know, this past year, truly for, I I assume most of us, has been one of the harder years of our life. Collectively, as as a culture, as a generation, I mean, I I doubt uh, that there has been any year like this collectively in our lives as we've gone through covid and restrictions. And in New York, a lot of death. I I talked to some friends in other parts of the country. They didn't have that much death. COVID obviously hit us fast and early, and we were the first ones to to really be ground zero for the pandemic. And I I personally have known uh, at least now 16 people that have died as a result of COVID. We, We have felt the reality of death. We felt the reality of loss, We felt the reality of financial loss. We felt the the reality of loss of loved ones, of being separated from people we care about because they needed distance because of uh, of health issues. We've we've dealt with loss in community and church. I mean, many of you watching this right now have not been to church in over a year and you're waiting until you believe it's safe to come back. I mean, there there is a lot. And I gotta say, in my own life, I, I, I try... Every Sunday that I preach to put on a, a, a smile. I, I, I try to be upbeat for our people and try to, to represent being a, a man of God in the storm. Like, it's okay, people. If I was Peter, I'd walk on water all the way to Jesus. I wouldn't have sank. I've had no hardships. I trust in the Lord with all my heart. I never have dealt with emotional negativity. But you know I'd be lying if I said that. The last year has been really hard. There are moments that I'm not proud of a lot of my thoughts. Moments where I felt the weight of depression. And it was crushing. (laughs) Moments when I felt unprovoked rage. Just ready to swing at anything. (laughs) Moments when I felt completely alone and abandoned, even when I was surrounded by people. And there were many times when I had to push back against this because it was the real reality of what I was emotionally experiencing in the hardships and challenges and difficulties of the last year. And I had to come back to this very truth that Jesus had not abandoned me, that I'm reacting to my circumstances. I'm not reacting to the truth of Jesus that I needed to recognize Jesus even in my pain, especially in my pain, that he is there. I may not necessarily see him in that moment, but I know he is right there with me. Because here's the thing, friends, when Jesus walks with us, there is always hope, amen? When Jesus walks with us, he is always present. When Jesus walks with us, we always have his strength. We always have the authority of his resurrection. When Jesus walks with us, we can always get through whatever is before us. But we have to be willing to recognize him in the process. We have to still see him in the storm. You know, it's interesting. If you go back to verse 21, as the disciples were explaining to Jesus what had happened, 
I find it interesting what they said. They said, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Notice they've moved on. They had hoped. It was past tense. Like they had hope, but their hope is gone right now. Right? They're like, I, I, that was the plan. That was the play. But, but our hope is, is missing. Yet ultimately they learned that they should still have hope that Jesus is in fact the one. And I think for you and I, I, I think this is the tension in which most of us, if we're honest, where we live. I, I think sometimes we live in the I had hoped instead of the I have hope. I, I, I had hoped that, that this hardship wouldn't have come, but I have hope that Jesus will get me through it. I had hope that, that, that God would have taken this away, but I have hope that even though I still am dealing with this, that I know I am not alone. I still have hope that no matter what happens on this earth, because I know that I put my faith in Christ, that I will be with him for all of eternity. I have hope that no matter what goes wrong, I know that I am loved by my Savior. I know that he's with me. You know, friends, the resurrection reminds us that when things look like they are over or dead or destroyed, Jesus is still stronger than all of them. And as we walk with Jesus, we have hope in all scenarios, in all situations, but we must recognize that he is still there. You know, what I love about this story is I believe we are all on a journey to Emmaus. We're all walking the walk. We're all on the path. The question that we have to wrestle is with or not is whether we recognize Jesus is there or not. Because I know he is. But you have to see him yourself. Jesus is speaking to us in this moment. He's trying to get our attention he wants to reveal himself to us, but we still have to be willing to have enough faith to say, I want to see you. I want to see you. He wants us to know him. He wants to have a relationship with us. And just as my relationship with Sarah has grown from our walks, Jesus wants to walk with you every day. But like all walks, it still starts with the first step. And I believe we're probably in two camps here today. The first is maybe for some of us, we just need to say, you know, Jesus, I, I've been walking with you for a while, but I've ignored you and I've stopped looking for you in, in the, the chaos of my life right now or even in the blessing of my life right now. Jesus, I need to see you and put you in the priority spot again. For others of us, this, is, this Easter, maybe this is the first time that you've really heard about who Jesus is. Maybe you've been religious your whole life. You've been baptized as a child and you've done confirmation and other maybe religious things that we do within the church, but you've never made Jesus personal. You never realized that he actually wants to walk with you and have a relationship with you. And so as I close this time out, before we close with our final song of worship, I want to say a prayer and I would love for you to pray it along with me. If you've never put your faith in Jesus before and you've never accepted the work of Jesus on the cross dying for your sin I want to give you the greatest gift that anyone could ever give you right now and that is Jesus will you shut your eyes bow your heads and pray with me you can pray out loud wherever you are or pray in your mind and your heart but just please don't let this moment go by without being able to see Jesus on your journey and so say this prayer Jesus, I come before you right now. And I thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Now show me how to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And friends, if anyone said that prayer along with me, please, please reach out to us. Whether it's in the chat, 
instant message one of us, email us, let us know that you've made that prayer because we want to show you what the next steps are and how to really now walk with Jesus for the rest of your life. Friends, I want to thank you for celebrating this Easter Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's celebrate together as we close out this service.